Okay, everybody, let's officially get started. We'll begin with the recording this session. We are recording it and live streaming it as well. So welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. Today, we are gonna go over a big topic. The topic today are canonical and landmark Supreme Court cases. This is an exciting topic, but I hope you ate your Wheaties because there's a lot of cases we have to go through. So we're gonna go really fast and have a lot of fun. As always, my name is Curry from the National Constitution Center and I will be your kind of chat question helper. So if you have any questions, put it in the chat or the Q&A. And we'll make sure we'll get them to our top scholar today, who's uh, Tom Donnelly. He's our senior fellow at the National Constitution Center. Tom, would you like to say hello to everybody? Morning. Hi, everyone. Can't wait to get started. OK, so let's, let's lay some foundation here. So number one, kind of the big idea of today's class is that the Supreme Court has been at the center of some of the most important constitutional debates in American history. And over time, the court's landmark decisions have shaped constitutional law across a range of areas. Areas that Tom is gonna to go over, but areas of the power of the government, the meaning of the constitution's promise for freedom and equality, and the balance of powers between the national government and the state government. But why do we study landmark cases? Real easy, it's real direct. We study landmark cases because first, that's how we learn how the judicial system actually works. It helps us understand the entire court system. Second, it shows us how past judicial decisions can affect the law today. And then it also lets us see how these court cases affect our lives and our individual rights. So many ways to understand our past and how it affects us today, but there's just one more. One more is we can look at these cases and try to make un like guesses educated guesses on what Supreme Court cases that are going to the courts, how they might be decided based on the past cases, this idea of precedent and where it comes from. So, so much to go over. And well, I thought we'd start, you know, how I love to start with definitions. Tom, give us a clean definition of what is a landmark case and what is a canonical case? Like, why did we use both of those words today? Not just because I like them. Curry, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I, the way I would look at it, the way I look at it, at least, is that a landmark case is one that is of great historical importance. So it has legal significance, historical significance, and it's going to have some sort of lasting effects. And so a landmark case, from my perspective, at least, it could be a good case or a bad case, but it's one that's very, very influential. Whereas if I'm looking at what would I call canonical, Canonical mm -hmm. cases are the really good cases that remain good law and are sort of the, the, the guiding stars of American constitutional law. And so with these, with these canonical cases, a case like Brown versus Board of Education, you might also find anti-canonical cases like Plessy v. Ferguson. So they're all landmark, but the canonic, I, to call something canonical, I would say it's, it's good and it remains good law. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I love that kind of theory. Um, and so we, what we did was we took these major cases and we broke them into different groupings. So let's begin where we always do. And we talk about foundations, kind of our, our, our basement, our foundational structure. And we pick these two big cases, Marbury v. Madison and McCullough. So tell us why these are foundational cases and then walk us through the storyline. Sure. So both of these cases come out of the Marshall Court. So this is Chief Justice John Marshall, the early Supreme Court in the early 1800s. And so with Marbury, we get a key case that's dealing with the powers of the Supreme Court. So it's really establishing the Supreme Court's role within our constitutional system. And with McCulloch v. Maryland, we get an early statement of how, many, the, the, how, how broad the powers of the national government are. So Marbury, Supreme Court, McCullough, powers of the national government, especially Congress. So should we jump into Marbury v. Madison? Okay, so it's, so it's 1803, Marbury v. Madison. Who was Marbury? Who was Madison? So Marbury, uh, he is a well-connected Federalist. He's an ally of John Adams. And what is Marbury complaining about here? He wants a job. So this, this case arises out of the election of 1800 between John Adams, a Federalist, Thomas Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, really, really close race. And after John Adams loses, He's still in power for a few months. And so he and his allies in Congress create all of these new judges, all of these new what are called justices of the peace, and they're called the midnight appointments today. But, but William Marbury is one of these appointees. And so he's saying, I want this job. Who's Madison? Yeah, it's that Madison, the one you see up there right there, the father of the Constitution. So it's 
William Marbury, this Federalist uh, calling, really wanting this job that John Adams gave him, and Madison on the other side, the new Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson and Madison not wanting to give it to him. And so why do we study this case today? There's all sorts of complicated facts, but let's, that, that's all you need to know about the factual context. Why do we study it today? Well, Chief Justice John Marshall issues one of the most influential rulings in Supreme Court history. And we read it today as largely establishing the power of judicial review. So this is the idea that the Supreme Court and the federal courts have the power to say a law passed by Congress, a law passed by the states that decide that constitutional or unconstitutional. Now, why was this a problem? Well, if you look at the Constitution itself, I have mine right here. There is no mention of judicial review. There's no explicit mention of judicial review. So there's a question here of, does the Supreme Court have it? Do the federal courts have it? And what Marshall says here is yes. Now he's not inventing this idea out of nowhere. We already see in the courts before Marbury v. Madison, including the Supreme Court, the, the theory of judicial review, the idea that courts are going to have this power. But we study Marbury because Marshall's statement in Marbury is probably the best statement we have anywhere of where this power comes from. And so what, is, what does Marshall say? Marshall says that, well, one, through the Constitution, Article Three, the Supreme Court, we're, giving the, we're given the judicial power of the United States. In Article Six, we see that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It's supreme over other laws passed by Congress. It's supreme over laws passed by the states. And then finally, I, as a judge under the Constitution, take an oath to uphold and defend it. And so as part of my duty as a judge, what I have to be able to do is if someone comes to court and is claiming power under a law that's been passed, but a law that is violated by the Constitution, I have to be able to say that's no law. That is unconstitutional. I cannot enforce it. I am constrained by this document. And so what does he say in Marbury v. Madison? Well, it's a really kind of an amazing, it's a convoluted case. It's a confusing case sometimes. It's complicated. But really what he says is one, William Marbury. You got this commission. You, 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 you should be a justice of the peace. Two, you really are right. The, the commission was given to you by John Adams, but three, I, 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 I uh, John Marshall, we, the Supreme Court, do not have the power to give it to you. Now, why do we not have this power? Well, Congress tried to give it to us, but we have to say the law that Congress passed giving it to us is unconstitutional. And so Mar Marbury, you might have, a, you might have, you might be able to get this job. Maybe you should get this job, but we can't be the ones to give it to you. So I'll sort of leave it, leave it there. Let me just read Curry the, you know, if there's one quote you want from Marbury v. Madison, here it is. It's in the Supreme Court. It's it's, it's posted in the Supreme Court halls. Halls. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. And so here, judicial review, law, constitutional, unconstitutional. So, and I, I love that line that you said, Marbury, and what Marshall says is, this is a law, this is not a law. And so like clarifying, that's what our job is to call, you know, to call balls and strikes. To, and I, that was um, Roberts that said that. That too. was John that's Roberts, our, yes. Yeah, I, good, I got it right. <laughs> um, so it's a, a great one. So, you know, there's another foundational case that comes out of the Marshall Court as well, and that's McCullough. So let's dive into McCullough real quick. Yeah, so McCullough get, gets at one of the great questions at the beginning of American history, which is, does Congress have the power to pass a national bank? Um, and so the big broad, I, the big broad uh, issue here in McCullough is, how much power does this new national government have? And so the, 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 this, this uh, constitutional question was debated in the Washington administration. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton thought a national bank was constitutional. James Madison, who was in the House of Representatives at the time, and Thomas Jefferson, who was Washington Secretary of State, thought it was unconstitutional. And so McCullough v. Maryland, this, this question finally gets to the Supreme Court about 30 years later. But this, the, the lines of debate are roughly the same constitutionally. Um, and, and the bank itself remains a, a topic of debate at this time. So who is McCullough? McCullough is uh, an official in the Baltimore branch of the Second Bank of the United States. And what has Maryland done here? What is McCulloch complaining about? Well, Maryland has imposed a tax on the national bank. And so the idea here being what they want to do is they want to, there's the threat here of taxing the national bank out of existence within the state of Maryland. And the two questions here are one, Maryland saying, well, one, the national bank's unconstitutional. We all know that. I don't care what the Congress says. I don't care what Washington said. It's unconstitutional. And two, does, does Maryland have this power to tax the national bank? And so uh, you know, what does Marshall say? Marshall says, one, the National Bank is constitutional. 
It is constitutional for Congress to create a national bank. Um, and so what Marshall says here is, you know, one, the challenges are right. There is no part of the text of the Constitution in Article I laying out the powers of Congress. There's nothing in there that says Congress can create a bank. But that's not how we should think about the Constitution. So Marshall lays out this, a broader theory of the Constitution that says the Constitution is not going to include every single detail of every little thing Congress can do. What it does is it lays out a set of powers, like the power to tax, the power to borrow money, the power to regulate interstate commerce. And then it has another clause in there in Article 1, Section 8 that says, and Congress has uh, you know, powers that are necessary and proper for carrying out everything that's listed in there. And so what Marshall says is, don't look for a clause saying the charter bank clause, the create bank clause, but look at the powers that Congress has given, look at the necessary and proper clause and see, is Congress doing something that's carrying out and related to the powers that Congress gives them? And what Marshall says is yes, when you create a national bank, Congress is entitled to conclude that if they're going to be able to tax properly, borrow money, declare and conduct war, all of these other things that we think the national government should be able to do, that creating a national bank is something that can help them carry out all of those responsibilities. So even though there's no charter bank clause in the constitution, a national bank is constitutional. Then finally, the last thing that Marshall says here is that Maryland, you cannot tax the national bank out of existence. The national government, the national government's institutions, they're supreme. That's what Article 6 of the Constitution says. National government, above all, if the national government's acting constitutionally, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And Maryland, you do not have the power to destroy institutions of the national government. So that's a lot. These two cases set up almost like the role of the Supreme Court in deciding laws, um, the roles of the, uh, the Congress in the necessary and proper, that it, it has these unspelled out jobs under this umbrella and that the, it, it kind of nods to the supremacy clause that the national government is supreme. So that's a lot. That's why these are foundations. Yeah. Now, the, the next big kind of jump we're jumping into, and I know you're going to group these together into the first three, but uh, the next theme is the Constitution promise for equality. So what are the three big cases that you like to weave together, Tom, in kind of teaching how we see cases over time and how they're connected? Almost like a forward and backwards movement too when talking about equality. Absolutely, so Curry, the, the, the three big cases here are Dred Scott, which happens before the Civil War. It's not listed in a bullet there, but we could say after Dred Scott, after the Civil War, we have the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. So we have new things added to the Constitution. And then we would fast forward to Plessy v. Ferguson, which happens you know, towards the end of the 1800s, and then Brown versus the Board of Education, which is in the middle of the 20th century. So what we see here is Dred Scott being the most infamous case about slavery before the Civil War, Plessy v. Ferguson being the case that helps establish Jim Crow segregation in the South, saying that that's constitutional, even after we've written a promise of equality into the Constitution. So that's Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal is okay. And then with Brown versus Board of Education, we see basically the beginning of a new era where we're seeing the Supreme Court and key, the civil rights movement and Congress and presidents like President uh, Lyndon Johnson, all breathing life into the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. So we have you know, the, the, the Supreme Court enforcing slavery and Dred Scott really uh, reading the, the Equal Protection Clause in many ways out of the Constitution, Plessy versus Ferguson, and then in Brown recommitting to that promise of equality, pushed by the civil rights movement, pushed by, by the NAACP, and, and, and ultimately uh, uh, really, really reestablishing the primacy of equality in American constitutional history. So should we start with Dred Scott, Curry? Absolutely, absolutely, sorry. So, oh yeah, so, so Dred Scott v. Sanford, it's 1857, so who's, who, who is Dred Scott? Well, there, there's, there's Dred and Harriet Scott right there. Uh, they're a couple, they have two young daughters. And what are they doing in Dred Scott? They're suing for their freedom. They do not want their daughters to have to live as enslaved people. And so that we see in this period, a lot of freedom suits, suits like Dred Scott where it's different enslaved people claiming the promise of freedom. In the, in the case of Dred Scott, the argument is our, our, you know, uh, the slaveholder here took us into land that was free, where slavery was illegal. And with that, we are free. Our children are free. And so really trying to get, this, get, get the, the, the federal courts to recognize their freedom and their, free, and, 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 and their children's freedom. 
So what does the Supreme Court say here? Well, the Supreme Court says, in, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney, says, no, you are not free. And, but even more than that, you cannot be United States citizens. Your children cannot be United States citizens. And African-Americans have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. And so here, it's the Supreme Court really setting out not only, like, so if, as we get to Plessy, we're going to see the Supreme Court setting out second class citizenship for African Americans. But the Supreme Court in Dred Scott is saying is, you are not citizens at all. You cannot be citizens at all. And so this is sort of the, that, that's, that's the other thing that the Supreme Court says is that, furthermore, Congress doesn't have the power to ban slavery in the territory. So it's both saying African Americans can't be citizens, have no rights, which white man is bound to respect. Furthermore, that Congress will not have the power to eliminate slavery in the territories. The thing, last thing to note here, Curry, is it's not as though these, this ruling went unanswered. There were two powerful dissents in the Supreme Court by Justice McLean and Justice Curtis. Justice McLean resigns over the Dred Scott decision as a matter of moral principle, was so outraged by it. And no, none other than Abraham Lincoln and his young Republican party will use Dred Scott as a rallying cry saying that the Supreme Court was wrong. Ultimately, we would obviously fight a civil war, but part of what we do after the civil war is we ratify a series of amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, which are meant to write the promise of freedom and equality into the constitution. One of those things with the 14th amendment, it's designed to overrule Dred Scott. And so right there after the civil war, we say, no, the Supreme Court was wrong. And one thing I want to point out to our students, because I know next week we're going to dive into the civil rights movement, um, is a, we watch African Americans from the beginning of America all the way through resisting and fighting for their freedoms. Harriet Scott fighting for their freedoms for her, her husband, and her children. And we see it in ways of resistance in all different ways as an end and civil rights movements where they're taking the law and saying, I need to push this law to say what it was supposed to do and a follow and live up to the Declaration of Independence and all men are created equal. So we're watching this resistance from the beginning of time. And these three cases really look at how people are using their civil rights and human rights to fight for freedom. So I just wanted to kind of string that through so we can see it in these cases um, and yes, nodding to Professor Jeffries, who we talked to last night, that keeps us looking at the big picture of fighting for rights. It comes in all different ways, through grassroots, through the legal system, and through the Voting Rights Act and other acts as well. So next one, sorry, Plessy v. Ferguson, segregation. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, even before we get to Plessy, it's important to remember that, so what's Plessy about? Plessy is about how do we read the 14th Amendment's promise of equality, the, the promise of equal protection of the laws to any person in the United States. And so before we get to Plessy, remember that we, we ratified that particular, the 14th Amendment in 1868, and we do have a period of time in the South where, where we actually try to live out this promise, where African-Americans are governors, members of the state legislatures, members of Congress. And so we really do have an experiment in interracial democracy. And these, these states pa passing constitutions, passing laws that really do enforce the promise of equality. But what Plessy reminds us is that even by 1896, less than 30 years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, we already see many states and the nation at large pulling away from this promise and ultimately almost writing that promise out of the Constitution. So what is Plessy? Who is Homer? So it's Plessy v. Ferguson. Who is Homer Plessy? Well, Homer Plessy is an African-American in Louisiana. And he's part of a, a committee of concerned citizens. And what they want to do is they want to challenge the 1890 Separate Car Act of Louisiana. So this is a law that says that ca rail cars in Louisiana, you have to have separate cars for white passengers, African-American passengers. And Homer Plessy said, I'm going to go board a, a, a white only car. I myself have been, I'm an African-American. I, I have a, a relatively lighter skin tone. It might be the case that no one would realize that I'm an African-American. So I'm gonna test this law and try to show just really how random and arbitrary it is, how unjust it is. And so Plessy does this. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a degree today where we say, of course a law like this, how could, how could a law like this ever stand up to the promise that the constitution has of equality? How could it possibly, how could it possibly be constitutional? But the Supreme Court in the seven to one decision says the Louisiana law is constitutional. It doesn't violate the 13th amendments abolition of slavery. It doesn't violate the 14th Amendment's 
promise of equality. Because that, and, and what, what is astounding, so this is a decision by Henry Billings Brown, who he's a northerner. He's originally from Massachusetts. He was a respected judge in Michigan. And, but what he says here is that a law like the one Louisiana passes, it's consistent with the powers that we think the states have. The states can pass laws to promote the health, safety, and welfare of their citizens. Um, and you know what? And he, and he has the audacity to also say, if African-Americans think that this brands them somehow as inferior, as a second-class group of citizens, well, that's, that's on them. The law says nothing like that. And so that's Brown. That's, that's Henry Billings Brown. That's seven justices of the Supreme Court. But then there's one dissenter, and it's the dissent that we really, really do remember today. And so the big dissenter here is Justice John Marshall Harlan. Now, John Marshall Harlan himself, he's from Kentucky. He's from a family of slaveholders. He opposed Abraham Lincoln. He opposed the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, but he changed his mind. He saw the illegality in the white South. He saw the extra legal violence against African-Americans. He came to believe deeply in the 14th Amendment's promise of freedom and equality. And what he says here is Justice Brown, Supreme Court majority, you're crazy. How can you possibly think that this law doesn't say to African-Americans, you're second class citizens. This law isn't designed to keep white citizens of Louisiana out of the cars of African-Americans. It's meant to do the reverse and it's meant to brand African-Americans in the state with inferiority. And here's the, here's the key quote from John Marshall Harlan that, we, that, that, that ends up inspiring so many people thereafter all the way up to Brown in 1954 and beyond. Brown versus Board of Education. Here's the famous quote. In the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens in respect of civil rights. All citizens are equal before the law. And then he makes a prediction. He says, in my opinion, the judgment this day rendered will in time prove to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in the Dred Scott case. He says that future Americans will get Dred Scott and Plessy together as big mistakes. And that's exactly what we're doing today. And, and again, again, going back to like, these are landmark cases, uh, but not canonical because they are not good. Um, they're, uh, the landmarks make sometimes are bad case decisions as well, but they make, they are made a big change and they needed to be changed again. So jumping to the next one, uh, Brown versus Board of Ed. And when we look at this case, I think, you know, this is one of the best pictures ever taken by, you know, a reporter. Cause you just look at that and you look at that little girl and say, we were fighting over where she could go to school based on the fact that we were having racist opinions of where children should go and how they should be separated. So what happens in Brown? Yeah, so yeah, so Linda Brown, she's a, she's a third grader. She's a third grader and all that she wants, she wants to go to her local school in Topeka, Kansas, the Sumner School. And, but, it's, but Kansas says, this is a white only school, African-Americans can't go there. And so Brown presents this big question to the Supreme Court. It's that, was Plessy right? Plessy said, separate but equal is okay. It's constitutional. So is that true? Is that still true in 1954? Um, and so the court has to wrestle with this. Brown versus Board of Education brings together similar cases from around the country. So, you know, uh, Linda Brown is from uh, Topeka, Kansas. So that's in the Midwest. They have a case from South Carolina, so from the Deep South. And then Virginia, Delaware, and Washington, D.C., sort of the, the border states of the North and the South. And But all of the students are simply asking for the same thing. Supreme Court, there's a promise of equality written into the Constitution. It goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. We lay claim to it. We are American citizens. We want to go there. And, and you know, when, when, when states, when governments create schools that separate white students from African-American students, what can be more unequal than that? We just want to be treated equally. And so what they're calling on the court to do is to say, court, you were wrong in Plessy v. Ferguson. And court, you must recommit to the, to the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, says Linda Brown, says, you know, third grader, says, you various students, you parents, who all you want is a free, a, 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 is, is an equal and good education for your, for, for your children, rooted in the promise of the 14th Amendment and its promise of equality, you're right. The Supreme Court, we the Supreme Court were wrong in Plessy v. Ferguson. 
separate is inherently unequal, even if we created equal schools for white students and African-American students, and of course we never did, but suppose we did, the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision written by Chief Justice Earl Warren say even that is unconstitutional because when you separate out white students from African-American students, you, 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 you uh, brand African-American students as second-class citizens. You make them feel inferior. You say they are inferior. And so with Brown versus Board of Education, we see a recommitment to the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. Now, Curry, the important thing to remember, and it's, it, it's exactly what you said, is this decision didn't come out of nowhere. It comes from decades upon decades of social, uh, 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 social movement, civil rights movement, uh, 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 arguing, uh, but it also it comes out of a legal strategy by the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall, who over time, case by case, chipped away and chipped away at Jim Crow segregation laws in different contexts, leading up to Brown. It got the court to say, no, segregation in law schools, unconstitutional. It said, you know, segregation in higher education broadly, it's unconstitutional. And then in Brown, we finally get it's unconstitutional. Separating white students from African-American students is unconstitutional in our public schools. And then projecting forward, Curry, the last thing I'll say is we then see more and more actions taken after that to promote equality. We see in Congress the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, 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 expanding the promise of equality. We see the Supreme Court in 1967, Loving v. Virginia, striking down state bans on interracial marriage and on and on. And so one, we see Brown and its influence expanding during that period. And then of course, what we know is that these debates live on. Debates over equality are at the core of what we as Americans do with our constitution. So in the, you know, especially in the, in the 1970s, we see women arguing that the 14th amendment belongs to them. It, as we get into the, the, the late 20th century and the early 21st century, we see debates over whether the 14th Amendment applies to the LGBTQ community. We see arguments on both sides about whether or not you can square affirmative action programs with, uh, with the 14th Amendment's promise of equality and so on. So these debates continue. So, and that's great. And we can see kind of this spread and it's, it's such a big idea and a big value in America that that's why we kind of uh, show you this through line, but there's many other through lines like Tom just spelled out. One like obvious thing about Brown versus Board of Ed that the desegregation of schools doesn't even really begin for what, almost 11 years? Um, it takes at yeah. least uh, 10 to 11 years to actually start to see the desegregation of schools like Little Rock and, uh, and others. I just wanted to like- Yeah, it's especially with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is really when you, when, when you see it a lot. Because you're right, Curry, I should bring up, it's not as though the Supreme Court said, you know, issued Brown and then all of the uh, all of the South said, oh, okay, you're right. No, there was massive resistance from many white Southerners. And with what utmost haste, what's the line uh, from the court? All deliberate oh, speed. That's it. I can never get it right. I always say it backwards. Okay, so now we're going to jump a little fast forward to um, Bill of Rights. So here's some cases. We're going to pick one and it's really two. Um, but the, when we look at the Bill of Rights, and we think about these individual rights. One of the one of our favorite cases, and also a really really important case, is uh, West Virginia v. Barnett. And it it also there's also a previous case on Gobitis. So I I really want to focus on these and partially students because they're some of the most moving stories about how children, just like Linda Brown, change the Constitution by their actions. Sometimes it takes a while, and sometimes it takes other people to take the 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 baton up after them, but it's really the power of students saying that this isn't fair and this isn't right, and I'm going to hold the Constitution accountable to my individual rights. So with that tee up, tell me about Barnett, tell me about the Go Bitis children. Sure, so let's start with Barnett and then we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll weave Go Bitis in. So West Virginia Barnett v. Barnett, case in 1943, so it's in the middle of World War, United States involvement in World War II. Who are the Barnetts? Well, they're, 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 they're children, they're in elementary school, and it's Marie and Gaithy Barnett, and they're Jehovah's Witnesses. And so what this case brings up is West Virginia has said that students in schools have to say the Pledge of Allegiance and salute the flag. And so this was, you know, prior to World War II and into World War II, there was a thought that our schools really need to pr promote patriotism. And so we see a lot of these these, uh, 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 these different rules passing in various states saying that students have to salute the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance. And what, what the Barnett's say is we're Jehovah's Witnesses. 
in our religion, we can't salute the flag. We believe that the highest law is God's law and that we can't salute law created by men and by, by, by governments. And so what they do is they refuse to uh, uh, say they refuse to, to salute the flag. And uh, this follows on. So like, as like Curry said, there was a case before West Virginia v. Barnett in 1940, where the Supreme Court said states, school districts, they can pass rules like this. And so that case also involved young Jehovah's Witnesses who said that no, because of our religious faith, we can't salute the flag. We don't mean any disrespect, but we can't salute the flag. They were expelled from school. And so the same thing happens to the Barnett children. What's interesting between Gobitis and Barnett and tragic between Gobitis and Barnett is that after Gobitis, so this is in 1940, um, we see waves of violence against Jehovah's Witnesses. They're seen as unpatriotic for not saluting the flag. And Gobitis, again, a case in 1940 saying that these flag salute laws are okay, was an eight to one decision of the Supreme Court saying that those flag salute laws were constitutional. The only dissenter was, uh, was Justice Stone. But then the, we, as we get to West Virginia Bar B. Barnett, it's 1943 and the Supreme Court admits they were wrong in Gobitis including some of the justices. So this, it goes from an eight to one in favor of the schools to six to three in favor of the students. And what the Supreme Court says here is, you know, effectively that we understand that the flag is a powerful symbol. Patriot, patriotism is important and patriotism is important in the context of war. Again, we're in the middle of World War II, but states cannot just run roughshod over individual conscience. That you can't just simply force people to be patriotic. That, that especially when someone's raging, raising a genuine religious objection, that goes against the First Amendment to the Constitution. And here's the majority opinion here in Barnett is by Justice Robert Jackson. And here's what he, there, there are many famous lines in here. One is that compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. And so what you see the Supreme Court saying here in many ways is we're currently fighting in World War II on behalf of freedom. And we have to honor that freedom here at home, including these courageous students who are willing to stand up and say, because of our religious faith, we can't salute the flag. They're expelled for this by their schools. And the Supreme Court is saying in Barnett, we have your back, we have your back. And so here's the, I just have to, I can't, I can't resist it, Curry. The most famous, one of the most famous lines ever the Supreme Court is written here by Justice Jackson. It says, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official higher petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act faith therein. What Robert Jackson is saying here is that the state can't force you to go against your individual conscience and that too, this is why we have a Bill of Rights and a Supreme Court sometimes. That there might, it might be very popular to have these sorts of flag salute laws, but when it violates a core protection in the First Amendment, sometimes it's only us, the Supreme Court, that can stand up for the dissenters, whether it's a religious dissenter like a Jehovah's Witness, whether it's someone saying speech that you hate, that it's the Supreme Court and the Bill of Rights that sometimes stand in the way and say, no, 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 that goes against our deepest constitutional values. And, it, and two things really quickly. One, those kids were young. The Gobitis children were like eight and 11. Eight and 11, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's really young. So just students, as you think about like, oh, you know, I have to wait till I'm 18 and I can vote. You have a lot of power and what you do, what you stand for is it really does matter. And that's why we have these classes with you. But uh, number two, I think one of the students pointed out on Monday, so many of these cases around religion and freedom of speech are really small religious groups. So you talked about religious dissenters. This isn't, it's typically not like a, a mainstream religious group. Many of them are small religious groups. And that kind of goes back to the, the statement from the court. We're here to stand up for everybody, not just the popular, not just the majority, correct? Oh, and the Jehovah's Witnesses are involved in so many of these cases, but you're right, the Amish and Yoder, uh, practicers of the Santeria faith and in Lakumi, um, you know, even in, in Employment Division versus Smith, it's Native Americans doing a spiritual ceremony. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it tends to be the, the smaller voices that, or the, the voices that are unpopular, that the court feels yeah. that it's, the, it's role to step in on their behalf. Got, yeah, and I remember we had Justice Kagan once say, um, and not about this case, about a flag burning case. Like sometimes we, our job is to stand up for things we don't like, but mm -hmm. it's about your right to be able to have freedom of conscience. So. 
in an, one minute, you can do it, Tom. I want you to do Korematsu because Korematsu is such a huge case. So I just put it in the chat twice. But real quick, give us a synopsis on Fred Korematsu. Sure. So Fred Korematsu, he's a 23-year-old. 20, he's born to Japanese immigrants. He's born in California. He's a Californian. He's an American citizen. And so what happens in Korematsu? It's again, we're, we're in World War II and FDR issues an executive order establishing internment camps for people of Japanese descent. And the government's argument here is we're at war with Japan. We're concerned about Japanese spies. We need to round up people of Japanese descent uh, uh, and, and place them into these camps. Um, it's essential to national security. Fred Korematsu, of course, says, no, do doesn't this, doesn't the constitution belong to me too? I may be of Japanese descent, but I'm a Californian. I'm an American and you're just rounding me up and, 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 and treating me like, you know, certainly not like an American citizen, not, not, not realizing the promises of freedom and equality in the constitution. And what does the Supreme Court say in Korematsu? In a six to three decision, the court says that executive order by FDR is constitutional. What it says and effectively is it's the, and, and the way we look at it today is we would say it, they're in the fog of war. Um, and what the court says is the president says we need this for national security. Congress has given the president broad authority to carry out this war. And that's enough. And that's enough here to make this constitutional. What ends up making Korematsu such a memorable case, and it, it is a part of the anti-canon. It's a case, it's a landmark case that we remember because we think today we look at this case and say, how could the court have come out this way? What's more clearly unconstitutional than sending Fred Korematsu without anything into an internment camp just based on suspicion? That's un-American, that's unconstitutional. We see three powerful dissents in the case by, uh, by Justices Murphy, Owen Roberts, and, and Jackson. But projecting forward, we see Fred Korematsu continuing to argue his case to Congress in the courts and what he achieves is extraordinary. Over time, we see one, the national government agreeing to give reparations to, to, to people who, who suffered as a result of the internment camps. We see Fred Korematsu getting his own conviction thrown out in federal court decades later. And Fred Korematsu gets the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And so it's this amazing story where, where it's him in, in, in the toughest of all times in the middle of war, fighting for his rights, but continuing to fight for them decades afterwards to make sure that the constitutional arguments he's making are recognized as right. And the last thing I'll say, Curry, is the Supreme Court in Trump v. Hawaii, the case dealing with President Trump's uh, immigration order. Uh, one of the things the court does say there is that Korematsu was overruled in the court of history. It was wrong the day it was decided. And so the court itself recognizing, again, its own mistake. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think you know, 40 years, 40 years of fighting and some people like Plessy never saw an, saw it overturned in their lifetime. So I think that's what's so amazing about all these landmark cases that it always begins with we the people. People bring these cases like Harriet Scott bringing that case to the court. It begins with the people bringing a case and fighting for their freedom, even if it, they know it might not be seen in their day to fight for, I think it's that John Adams quote, I hope in my, in my son's day that, that they will not see war, they will not see this pain. Um, and we see these great Americans defining our constitution by the actions that they take through the court. So Tom, thank you so much. Um, that was a really fun fast forward through the court cases. Uh, I, mean, I know, and we didn't even get to all of them, but there's even more in the, um, the brief. And uh, Iman points out that some of these cases, especially with the Korematsu, the information given to the government was not correct. And Iman, that's a great point on this case too. Um, horribly shocking, but when you dig into it, um, how much it was not correct. Who was, uh, and I'm gonna, pa I'm gonna stop the recording now and we can get to this question right afterwards. So let me stop real quick. Thank everybody for joining us. And 